So this, there's ver a variety of biomarkers that you're suggesting yes. people can uh, go and get measured. Yes. Uh, you know, to this, what did you call it? The, the cognoscopy. Cognoscopy, yes, yeah. that's a yeah. nice term. Um, so it, the, including the, the genetic factor, APOE4, seeing if they're APOE4, and then you have a variety of biomarkers um, that you kind of just mentioned. Um, some of those I think you also have published on before, talking about um, mm -hmm. the, the uh, insulin sensitivity as well, right. looking at uh, insulin sensitivity and um, glycated hemoglobin. Right. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about some of those biomarkers and how sure. so you have this wonderful protocol um, let's see, the MEND protocol. Right, so it's so, now called RECO. So MEND uh, was the very first edition. That was metabolic enhancement for neurodegeneration. Mm -hmm. But as we have, uh, we, we've made 2.0 and 3.0, and we have made it more sophisticated, as I mentioned in the book, um, it's become RECODE, which is for reversal of cognitive decline. And we now have uh, over 3,000 people who are on this protocol with unprecedented, and we've published a, a number of the results. We actually have another thing that's, uh, that's just finishing up that, re that reports another 50 people um, who have shown improvement. 50, like wow. So, so, you're, so the, the publications that I had read, you had shown, I think there was about 10. There was 10, 10 and then there was another, there were another 10. Another and, 10. A different 10, yeah. Right, and, um, and you showed and then, that they were, you, had, you were able to basically take a person and, um, that had Alzheimer's disease, some of them had to leave work because of their issues, right. You put them on a protocol, and they were not not only were able to some of them return to work, but they also seemed to have brain mass returning, yeah. um, and just so it was really phenomenal. Um, so some of these, some of the very you know complex diet lifestyle intervention that you you did here, maybe we can talk about some of the key ones. Sure. Um, starting with like this diet overhaul. That yeah, and and I should say, you know, it goes back to one very simple principle. We've been trying to treat this disease without knowing what causes it. So I usually tell people it's, it's as if you took your car into the mechanic because it wasn't working well. And the mechanic said, oh, Rhonda, no problem. Um, this is called car not working syndrome and your car's going to die. And you said, well, wait a minute. I mean, shouldn't you figure out why? Why something? What went wrong with it? And I said, well, no, you know, the testing is, isn't reimbursed, so we're not going to do that. And, and that's, un that's the unfortunate situation we've been in. People say, we don't know what causes it. There's nothing to do about it. You know, there's nothing we're going to do, and you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And medicine is changing in the 21st century, as you know. It is becoming less about monotherapeutics and more about programmatics. And at the, at the center of this is to understand why complex chronic illnesses occurred. When you have something like this, a simple illness like pneumococcal pneumonia, you find the pneumococcus, you treat the pneumococcus, and all the other underlying things, alcohol, diabetes, anything that could have been contributing is less important because you got at the pneumococcal pneumonia. That's not the case with complex chronic illnesses. With Alzheimer's, there are dozens of things that can be contributing. And so what we want to do is address all of those. Yes, if you have pathogens, uh, many people have, for example, Borrelia from Lyme disease or a Lyme co-infection like Bartonella or Babesia or Ehrlichia, things like that, then those need to be addressed. And of course, you need to change the underlying biochemistry. So as you indicated, there are specific biomarkers. So we want to know your HSCRP. We, your, it's a marker of inflammation, of course. We want to know your homocysteine, a marker of methylation. If you're not methylating appropriately and your homocysteine is high, then you are at increased risk for neurodegeneration. And of course, it's been published that you have a more rapid decline in your cerebral gray matter volume and hippocampal volume if you have a high homocysteine. Is that because of vascular reasons, or what's, what's the homocysteine? Well, the publication did not distinguish. It just sem simply followed people over years and looked at the rapidity of the decline in volume and could show that not only was it more rapid, literally you could put the, the rapidity of it on a, uh, you know, on a graph with homocysteine and it fit very nicely, but then if you improved the homocysteine and brought it back to normal, and they were looking at less than seven as being normal, not less than 13, which is often used less in labs, seven, seven oh, as being okay. normal. Then in fact, what happened was people actually stopped their decline and leveled off. 
So it's suggested that this has a, it is a causal relationship, that it is a mediator wow. of cognitive, well, of change in cerebral volume as Independent well as cognitive Independent of other um, biomarkers? Independent of other biomarkers, still, yes. Wow. So, uh, so we want to know that. We want to know whether you have glycotoxicity. So we want to know what is your fasting insulin. And again, people will accept it way off the scale. We have an unfortunate situation where uh, classically we have accepted laboratory values as within normal limits, WNL, very arbitrarily as being within two standard deviations of the mean. That actually makes no sense physiologically. It just says that there's a distribution there. It doesn't say that that's optimal for your health. So we'd like to know uh, what your fasting insulin is, and optimally it would be less than five or less than five. Um, although, again, within normal limits goes much higher than that. We'd like to know your uh, hemoglobin A1C, which again is a marker of your, uh, of your, essentially over the last two months, your serum glucose. We'd like to know your fasting glucose. These three actually give you quite complementary pieces of information all related to this type 1.5 that I mentioned, the glycotoxic type. And then the atrophic, as you can imagine, there are lots of things. We want to know your vitamin D. And again, we want to see that it's optimal, not suboptimal, but within normal limits. Um, we want to know your pregnenolone, progesterone, estradiol, testosterone, free T3. Now we'd like to know your brain-derived neurotrophic factor and your NGF. There's no simple way on a clinical lab test today to get those. So you have to infer them from other things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is your, uh, what is your hippocampal volume? What are, you know, what have you been doing? If you change these various things we've been talking about, you're likely to have a decrease. Have you been exercising? If you're not exercising, your BDNF is likely to be lower. So we want to look at all of the trophic support for your brain because these are critical things. If you're going to make and keep a large network of synapses, you need to have that support. And again, that balance changes for many of us as we age, especially if we are ApoE4 positive. ApoE4 gives you an advantage in that you have a hair trigger, essentially, for inflammation. You are responding. So if you live in a squalid environment like the Chimane Indians that uh, Professor Tuck Finch st studied, for example, uh, or the uh, Ghana tribe that, uh, that Tuck also uh, has studied, um, you are in better shape if you're ApoE4 positive. But if you're not living in a pro-inflammatory, in an environment that's parasitic, then in fact, you have this chronic inflammation um, that, again, good for when you're fighting things, good for if you step on a nail, uh, good for uh, situations that, are, that should be pro-inflammatory, but in the long run, counterproductive. Um, so, um, you know, as you know, uh, this is uh, you know, this is so-called antagonistic pleiotropy. This is something that can help you when you're young, but actually can put you at risk for diseases that will shorten your lifespan. And typically, cerebrovascular disease, of course, Alzheimer's disease. And as you know, uh, ApoE4 is actually underrepresented in centenarians. So it has been a short jevity gene, as it were. Mm -hmm. Again, that is changing um, and can change to, by understanding what's, you know, what's actually being driven by this. So we want to know all those markers and those for the type 2. And then, of course, we want to know the markers for type 3. So we want to know if there are specific toxins and especially mycotoxins. So the, the toxins can be metallotoxins like mercury, relatively common one. They can be organic toxins like DDE, things like that. They can be biotoxins like trichothecenes, ochratoxin A, aflatoxin, gliotoxin. These are toxins produced by various mold species like Stachybotrys and Aspergillus and Penicillium, which are literally you know, fighting us. I mean, they're literally saying, okay, I'm fighting back. And for example, one of the, one of the responses has been um, when you have uh, mold growing on treated wood, they're recognizing something's changed. Mold that have been treated with fungicide, um, so these are things where, just as we're seeing increasingly bacteria 
that are antibiotic resistant. Um, as Professor Shoemaker has pointed out, uh, the, uh, Dr. Richie Shoemaker, um, who's done so much word, uh, work over the years on mold and mycotoxins, uh, and described what he calls SIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Um, as we've had fungicides, as we've had uh, you know, buildings uh, with leaks uh, where we haven't recognized the danger from these. In fact, we've had more and more of this mold-related illness. So we want to know all those things for the type threes. And then of course, we also want to know, do you have a history of head trauma? We want to know if you have vascular compromise. All of those things are critical. Now you mentioned the diet. So yes, we want to start with the basics. But again, ultimately, it's a program that is customized to you based on what's actually causing your cognitive decline or your risk for cognitive decline. And so the nutritional part we call KetoFlex 12 slash 3. And it's for a very simple reason. So keto, so we want people to be in mild ketosis because that actually turns out to work better for cognition. And many people do better with their cognitive decline just as Mary Newport showed, of course, with using coconut oil. And that may or may not be the best way to do it for some people. Um, other people like caprylic acid, you know, MCT oil. Other people can, are very good at generating endogenous ketones, which if you can do it, is the best way to do it. Um, and uh, so we want to drive you into mild ketosis, which means a very low carbohydrate, high fat, good fats, diet things like avocados and nuts and seeds and things like that. And there is a caveat for people who are APOE4 um, and a caveat for people who have very low BMI. So we can talk about that. The next piece is flexitarian. So you can be a meat eater or not. Um, in general, we see meat as a condiment. Uh, but you know, and again, you know, as we evolved, we tended to eat relatively small amounts of meat. But that's fine. If you do, if it's going to be chicken, it should be pastured chicken. If it's going to be beef, it should be grass-fed beef. Um, can I have fish? Great. Um, uh, make sure it's wild-caught, not farmed fish. You don't want to have the fish with high mercury. Those are the large-mouthed, long-lived fish, tuna, shark, uh, you know, swordfish, things like that. You want to stay away from those because they can contribute to your cognitive decline.